My name is Maluba Habanama. I am the Canadian Foundation for AIDS Research. I am one of their national ambassadors. I've been living with HIV for 27 years and I'm so glad to be celebrating Black History Month with you all and we're going to be talking to Tola. So I am so excited and I do see she's already here. So I'm very excited. Okay. There we go. Hello, Tola. How are you? I'm well, Maluba. How are you? I'm good, thank you. We met quite years ago. We kind of, yeah, yeah when I was a baby, baby activist and you were working in the sector. And now right. you're doing even much bigger things. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've kind of transitioned uh, from working, you know, uh, in a community-based setting to, you know, doing my PhD. Yeah, so I, I, our paths have definitely crossed many times Absolutely. over the past decade. So it's really great to be able to talk to you today. Absolutely, and thank you so much. And apologies for uh, the, the late timing, technology issues and all that. It happens, and it's happening now more than ever, right? So yes, no worry. <laughs> definitely. So I'm going to tell our audience just a little bit about you. So Tola is a third-year PhD candidate in the Social and Behavioral Health Sciences Program at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health, University of Toronto. Ms. Mbulan, is that right? Mbulaheni. Mbulaheni. Met um, there you go. <laughs> brings 10 years of research experience related to Black African women and social contexts of HIV and prevention spanning Canada and South Africa. Her doctoral research will focus on critically examining structural forms of racism shaping women's experiences in these services and the subsequent impacts on their decision making related to HIV and racism, pre pre prevention and treatment care. Tola is bringing a burgeoning scholar of critical theories of race and racism, including critical race theory and black feminist thought. Big bio. So first, <laughs> my first question is, how are you? I'm well, and I, you know, I know this, it, it, we all sound like broken records at this point, but I'm well, all things considering, right? right? So yeah, I, I'm doing quite well. How about you? <laughs> I'm all as well, you know, all things considering. Exactly. Right. Yeah, same thing to describe. Um, I did tell our audience a little bit about you, but I'd like to know, mm -hmm. what would you like them to know about you when you're not researching or teaching? What are you doing? Well, when I'm not researching or teaching, I am spending lots of time with my family. I am a mom of a seven-year-old um, and a wife to a phenomenal husband and father. Uh, yeah, so I love spending time with my family, you know, pre-COVID. I love to travel. Um, it was one of the things I've always loved to do. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I, I was born and raised in Toronto. This is my city through and through. Um, I grew up in Parkdale area uh, uh, from parents who were born in Nigeria and Barbados, uh, even though I was, I was born here and I grew up here. Um, but yeah, that's just a little bit about me in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you. So then could you, what led you to decide to do this research and to be a part mm -hmm. of this field? You kind of described a little bit of it at the beginning. That's a great question. I think it's a culmination of a lot of things. Uh, my own lived experiences as a Black woman growing up in Toronto yeah. from, um, you know, pe uh, parents who emigrated here into the diaspora from the continent, but also from the Caribbean that, you know, I have my academic background in anthropology. So just taking interest in cultural and social understandings of health of black women in particular, uh, but also just, you know, being not, I mean, I wasn't around for the very beginning of the epidemic, but, you know, seeing how it was impacting our community um, in very, in disproportionate ways and in multiple ways, and just wanting to be a part of the work to redress that, right? right? Yeah, I lived in South Africa for two years as well, which has a very well-known history of racism and also one of the largest epidemics in the world. Uh, so being, you know, on the front lines, living in this new country, seeing all the amazing work that's being done there, but also having, you know, very overt experiences of seeing how structural, race and play, structural racism plays out for Black folks. Um, coming back to Ontario, working in the sector, and also seeing how, sim 
you know, a system of structural racism is also shaping HIV um, rates within our own communities really wanted me to learn more about it and to not just expand conversations, but maybe to even challenge some of the ongoing conversations around HIV risk, uh, prevention, treatment, and support and care for Black communities, but Black women in particular. Oh, awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your research in initiative that you do with Canbar. Sure. So my research, or it's, you know, this uh, supports my doctoral research, uh, is focused on better understanding how Black women in the greater Toronto area experience HIV prevention and treatment services, mm -hmm. and specifically how structural forms of anti-Black racism shape those services. Um, I also want to be critical of how they interpret these these experiences through their stories, how they make sense of them, but also importantly, how do these experiences then inform the decisions they make around HIV prevention and treatment practices, right? I think that's very important as well. We know that Black women are disproportionately impacted by HIV in Canada, but we also know that Canada has an extremely robust response so I think that this research can help us better understand what that particular, what, you know, that disconnect may be in the context of race and racism. Absolutely. And that resonated so much because when you think about health care or think about the number, mm -hmm. yes, Black women, we don't make up a lot of population of Canada, but are disproportionately affected by it. And that goes mm -hmm. to all the systemic racism going around. So I think that is something to talk about. So can you tell us about how the research is innovatively using critical race theory and what led you to choose this theory mm -hmm. and why has it not been used up until this point? That was a surprise to me. Right. Yes, that's a great. I think within public health specifically, it hasn't been taken up extensively. Uh, you know, critical race theory comes out of legal studies, particularly critical legal studies within an American context or a U.S. context. And it has also largely been taken up within educational studies, right, um, or studies of education. But specifically public health, it hasn't been widely taken up. The scholarship around it is very limited. What drew me to it in particular is I think a lot of conversations, particularly before the global pandemic, were really focused um, on interpersonal forms of racism if racism was ever discussed within a public health context, right? So we see within HIV research or policies in particular, you know, it was understanding and responding to the clinical encounter, right? So how someone, you know, as a Black woman would go to access a service and experience racism, usually from a service provider or something happening specifically in that um, encounter, which is extremely important. And it resulted, so I don't want to downplay that, but it has resulted in a response that tends to focus on initiatives that, you know, are around training service providers to be more culturally sensitive, quote unquote, right? right. Um, again, not inherently problem, um, problematic if done correctly. But what I found was often lost in the conversation was, well, what's creating that environment to begin with, right? What is happening at a more macro level or a structural level mm -hmm. that is even um, shaping how a service provider may think about or construct that person who's walking into their access, their services, right? What are the policy and policy frameworks that are mediating how that service takes place? What are the institutional practices that have been normalized um, that shape how that interaction may have happened? And furthermore, what are the knowledge systems we're drawing from uh, that, you know, rationalizes a lot of what's happening in this clinical encounter, mm -hmm. right? And I found it was really difficult within a Canadian context in particular to find discourses or conversations that are happening at that level when we're talking about racism, right? Yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but, you know, you know, now that we're in the current moment of COVID-19, it has reinvigorated within Canada conversations around racism yeah. and anti-Black racism in particular. So I do think, you know, there, this moment is ripe for, you know, to not only talk about this in the context of COVID-19, but to have that facilitate 
or catalyze conversations within the HIV response as well. I think that's very important. And I think up until this point, we haven't been having those type of conversations to talk about what structural black or anti-black racism looks like in the HIV response that black women are experiencing. Right. Absolutely not. You're mm-hmm. correct on that. And so what mm-hmm. outcomes? I know, you know, you never know the research what's going to be the outcomes, but what outcomes are you hoping to see as a result of this research in the GTA and beyond? Well, you know, first and foremost, and I actually, I, you know, kind of responded to your question, but went on a bit of a tangent. But just, you know, before I answer that question, speaking to critical race theory, critical race theory is a tool that can help us conceptualize racism at a more structural level, right? And I think a lot of racism in Canadian society has been normalized and naturalized to the point where we don't see it. You know, we don't see when it's playing out. And so therefore, you know, when issues around racism are raised, they make it dismissed or pushed to the periphery because, you know, they're they're not seen as being racist as racism. And critical race theory offers a different way to not only talk about these conversations or talk about these issues, but, you know, a different way to conceptualize race and racism in Canada as well. Mm-hmm. Right? And particularly within public health, I think that is underdeveloped at the moment. But in terms of what I'm hoping findings from my research can inform, first and foremost, you know, tying back to what I just said, I do want it to support ongoing conversations around how we think about racism um, and how we think about race, right? So really bringing that to the fore So, you know, highlighting race and racism within the HIV response, but specifically, you know, informing policy and other response, service provision responses in that respect. I also wanted to contribute to conversations um, and holding myself accountable and, you know, all others who are implicated in the HIV response accountable in research, HIV policymakers, um, clinicians, and so forth to critique the environments in which they are providing services, in which they are producing knowledge, right? In which they are developing uh, treatments, be it within uh, randomized controlled trials, all the way to frontline uh, service delivery, right? right? So across, you know, the vast, all the domains that comprise the HIV response, uh, but also across the HIV care cascade, you know, having us as a sector be critical A, acknowledging that anti-Black racism shapes our respective um, services and areas of work, but also be critical of what it actually looks like and work to respond to it so that we can effectively not only um, respond to the HIV epidemic within Black communities, but also specifically for Black women. And then we could develop a strong, robust, coordinated response specifically for Black women. Absolutely. I love that because I just um, I, I, I get involved with research too and kind of behind the scenes. I really like to hold researchers to the fire and be like, what is it going to mm-hmm. do to implement? Hopefully this isn't something that ends up on a shelf. And so I love that right. you have this whole plan of how to really critically look at things and change things around. Um, the next question you kind of did explain, and I feel like I have my own answers to it as well, mm-hmm. um, I think personally and professionally. But what are some of the reasons you believe Black women? Women, mm-hmm. black, uh, black women specifically, are disproportionately affected by HIV? I mean, and that's a big question, right? Yeah. So, you know, firstly, acknowledging that Black women are a, divi- a, divi- uh, a diverse group, particularly within a Canadian context. Um, <clears throat> but at the intersections of race and gender in particular, you know, Black women face a plethora of multiple forms of dis- discrimination, particularly when it comes to racism and sexism. And other forms of discrimination, including homophobia, transphobia, um, and so forth. I think one of the major factors that we do continue to navigate is that many of us are ex- economically excluded from the labor market or we're underemployed. Mm-hmm. Um, we are navigating disproportionately precarious employment um, or, you know, and or our wages tend to be less than our white counterparts um, and our male counterparts, right? So black women make um, I think I believe it was 88 cents on the dollar, and and this stat is relatively older, but still we know that Black women do not make as much money as their white counterparts for doing the same work, right? And this is exacerbated specifically when we talk about Black women who have immigrated to Canada, right? Um, so I think that's very important. 
Black women are also navigating other social discrimination issues, um, multiple forms of violence um, within communities, but also external to communities. Uh, they're navigating issue issues around accessing, um, not just accessing the education, but having that translate into work that reflects their level of education um, and a multitude of other um, issues in terms of what that means for HIV risk. Right. So, you know, looking at the social, economic, political issues that black women have to navigate, you know, that does translate into a risk environment that may be that may make them more vulnerable to acquiring HIV. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, be it in negotiating safer sex practices or, you know, whatever the case may be. Furthermore, for those who want to access service, be it living with HIV or not living with HIV, there are multiple barriers that this presents. Right. Um, and they all work together. Um, they create a complexity of issues that can put black women at greater risk for HIV, but also make it difficult to access quality H um, HIV prevention and treatment services as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just and that was my explanation, too, when I first saw the question is it all kind mm -hmm. of comes down to racism. And that's really a huge part of it. Even when you just look mm -hmm. at I feel like every month i'm hearing about a black woman who uh passed away giving birth in yeah. the delivery room because she wasn't given paid medication and so you think about the healthcare system um related to black women and how easily we fall through the cracks right yeah which is, um, absolutely yeah and so i'm wondering what are some of the prevention-based strategies you hope to see put in place as a result of the research that's a big question you know, I, I see my research, well, this particular research initiative as a contribution um, to larger initiatives around this. So first and foremost, one thing I really want my research to contribute to is to expand how we think about what HIV prevention is, right? Yeah. Typically, when we talk about HIV prevention, we are talking about it within the context of biomedical HIV prevention uh, interventions, right? So condom use, PrEP, PEP, and so forth, which are all very important. I don't want to negate that. But I think that one thing I want my research to do is to highlight the structural factors, right, that shape how these interventions are not only developed and distributed, but how these interventions are accessed or become inaccessible to Black women, right? So in terms of a prevention strategy, Prevention needs to be discussed or responded to in tandem with other forms of interventions, right? You know, if we're talking about Black women not having, being underemployed or unemployed at higher rates than other demographics within the country, and this contributes to HIV risk or access to quality um, treatment, um, aid prevention treatment, support, and care, then an effective HIV prevention strategy could be, you know, um, advocating for the increase of minimum wage, right? And things of that nature. I think the HIV's um, response has come to a point where, and we've been leading the way in this as well. I don't want to make it seem like, you know, that hasn't been the case, but I do think we need to be expanding uh, how we think about HIV prevention and the strategies that we do want to implement need to in integrate, need to meaningfully integrate these other you know, larger pieces that are shaping how Black women make choices around HIV prevention, treatment, support, and care. Absolutely. And you mentioned COVID-19 and kind of what we're learning mm -hmm. from that. Are there any other lessons that can be learned from the pandemic and how it relates mm -hmm. to the HIV epidemic and vice versa? Right. So, you know, I think considering the time that, you know, COVID has fundamentally changed all of our lives, right? But one thing that it has inevitably done is actually catalyze conversations around anti-Black racism in particular within Canada, right? Um, the type of conversations we're willing to have now, I don't think this was necessarily the case even five years ago. So I think, and you know, COVID-19 is being discussed as, um, uh, as not just obviously a pandemic, Right. But it's something that is catalyzing or facilitating racism and is facilitated by racism. Right. And I don't think for the majority of the HIV, HIV response, 
So we're like in the fourth decade of the epidemic at this point, you know, that was that just simply wasn't the same trajectory. Right. And I think that the HIV, um, you know, response can really take notes in this respect. Right. How can we not only like facilitate discourses around racism and HIV, but what does that mean for our existing response? How would we have to change it? How would we have to you know, respond in a different way if we're really intent on um, ending the epidemic amongst Black communities in the country. So I think that COVID-19 in particular, you know, although it's, you know, new, relatively new compared to the HIV epidemic, has really laid some groundwork for that to happen. What I will say about, um, in terms of what lessons COVID-19 response can learn from the HIV response, I think HIV, the response to HIV has been unique in the sense that it really was catalyzed by a grassroots movement, right? Globally, yeah. right? Um, my personal experience has been here in Toronto, so the HIV Endemic Task Force, which then um, evolved into ACHO, the African Caribbean Council on, um, uh, on AIDS in Ontario, and other Black-led uh, community organizations, um, and then South Africa, the Treatment Action Campaign. Right. So having meaningfully engaging community, but specifically meaning, meaningfully engaging uh, black folks living with HIV in leading a response, you know, for them and by them, I think is something that we've seen flourish within the HIV response globally. And I really want that that same principle, same principles to be taken up within COVID-19 as well. Right. So particularly in the context of speaking about, you know, where we have vaccines available, um, and, you know, hopefully in the near future, they'll be widely distributed amongst the general population. And we also know that medical distrust is deeply deep seated within the community for very viable reasons. And it's really important that uh, community is centered in response, not just the vaccines, but, uh, you know, all aspects of the uh, response to um, COVID-19 in order for it to be effective for our communities. Right. So I do think that's one thing that we can a lesson learned from the HIV response that COVID-19 can take up. Absolutely. I agree. And I want to go back for a second. You must have had mm -hmm. valuable mentors that got you to this place that you feel. And now that you're kind of in that senior leadership, you're going to be um, a mentor to people and have mentees. So I, I want to say, like, what advice do you have for fellow researchers watching, um, fellow academics or anybody wanting to get involved in this and just in general and what advice you have and what does it mean to you to be a mentor? What does it mean to be a mentor? You know, I in terms of how the word is traditionally used, I kind of take a bit, I'm critical of it in the sense that I strongly believe in mutual mentorship. I believe that whatever I can teach, there's so much more I can learn from that individual. So I think that's really, really important. What would I, it's a great question. I would really encourage, let me start with those who are allied to redressing anti-Black racism. I would really encourage the work, the critical ongoing lifetime work of recognizing and responding to our, you know, implicit racial biases, right? I think that's really important. It always starts with self. Um, and that's, like I said, that's ongoing. Uh, it's not, you know, something that we're just doing in the moment. It's something that is, is, you know, is done for a lifetime. I would also encourage, you know, to recognize your privilege, what that means, how it has in many ways, you know, given you um, various privilege across different, you know, social opportunities, better health outcomes or whatever the case may be. And, you know, op be open to that, I think is really important. Come with an open mind. Importantly, I do think it's important to center the voices of the most marginalized. I think, you know, particularly within like, all spaces, it's not unique to um, the HIV sector, but I do think a lot of those who are at the table, a lot of those who are in positions of leadership and making the decisions around the very services that Black communities are uh, accessing may not necessarily re be represented by those communities, right? So think about how can you, not just on an individual level, but a policy level, uh, de leadership, decision-making, how can you help to amplify the work that's already being done, but also supporting, you know, uh, 
early career researchers or, you know, uh, community members to do this work as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And that kind of goes into my next question. So I just want to reiterate it, which is mm-hmm. obviously we're in Black History Month and we mm-hmm. all you know, uh, like last year when we had the Black Squares during June and now it's Black History Month and we're talking, but um, what advice or what do you want to see ongoing for the years where it's not, you know, white people just wake up to racism on February 1st and then close the book on it on February 1st? Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, can you repeat that? You just cut out for a second. Oh, sorry. The, the, the last part of your sentence. Oh, yes, I just, what do you want to see ongoing but beyond that, it's not just somebody opening a book on February 1st for Black History Month and closing mm-hmm. it on February 28th. What do you want to see the impact have um, throughout the uh, throughout the year? I mean, I think I just want to see an ongoing commitment, yeah. you know, meaningful engagement, not just engagement. Because, I, you know, again, like I said, I think one of the unique things about the HIV response is that, you know, it really took up centering community. Yeah. And in research in particular, that ha- one of the responses has been community based research. Right. Which is phenomenal. But I think what often can happen is that it becomes tokenistic. Right. Uh, and so we we look to diversity. Oh, look, we have X amount of folks represented on this board or whatever the case may be, which is, again, not inherently a bad thing. But what I want to see is the meaningful, sustained commitment that that means sustained funding, sustained support, sustained silence, oftentimes. Right. Giving space yeah. for. Um, black communities to not only voice what's happening, but to you know, lead a response to it, I think is really important. You know, moments happen, they come and they go. So we cannot just be doing this because of the moment, right? Be it Black History Month, be it (coughs) police brutality being exceptionally hyper visible over the past year, you know, be it any of these circumstances, right? Uh, I want this, I just want the sustained commitment. I think that's really important. So for anyone who is beat on an individual level doing the work of, you know, unlearning, you know, commit to it. Like I said, it's a lifetime commitment. In terms of those who are in leadership positions that, you know, play an integral role in developing policy, producing knowledge um, related to HIV or and impacting Black communities and Black women in particular, you know, commit. What does sustained commitment mean in terms of funding schemes for research? What does sustained commitment mean in terms of changing the institutional practices of clinical and community settings, right? So that they are accessible and safe for Black women. What do all these things mean? Um, and one thing I will say, what it, what I want to, you know, not happen any anymore is putting this labor on, give, putting on a platter for Black women to do. Right. Right? I think that's really important as yeah. well, um, which is typically unpaid um, and often unsupported, you know, hold hold ourselves accountable absolutely. and commit to the work and see it through absolutely i can't agree more i think it's very interesting how you're constantly asking black people for advice or to teach or to learn and having that sustained commitment is definitely the first step um so canfer's mm-hmm. 2025 campaign goal is to eradicate the hiv epidemic in canada within the next five years mm-hmm. how can properly addressing quality treatment and care for black women help canfar reach this goal yeah i mean how can it help canfar address this goal i think that you know ending an epidemic for all of canada means ending the epidemic for black women mm-hmm. right exactly. so it's it's almost you know kind of if you want to end the epidemic you have to you have to address how it's impacting black women in particular and black communities more broadly right it's a requirement um and if it's not seen as one then we have a larger problem black people are being you know excluded from the response right mm-hmm. uh, so in terms of i mean treatment and care in particular I think, you know, I feel like I'm going to, again, sound like a broken record, but again, it's it's in the context of my research, but just more broadly, the approach that I'm applying yes. is that, you know, be critical of, of the spaces, the systems 
um, that these services in particular are being offered into, right? Like you mentioned earlier, be critical of the historical legacies of medical distrust and how they continue to play out in how Black women see, understand, and engage such services. You know, I always say that because, you know, interventions are efficacious doesn't make them effective, right? right? In order to be effective to the communities that they're being targeted to, you know, there has to be that level of trust, right? Uh, so I think, you know, it's kind of taking a step back. Yes, talk about treatment and let's talk about care, absolutely. But what is the larger infrastructure in which that treatment is being developed and in which it is being distributed, right? Yeah. And I, I, I really hold that to be very important. And it's not just in terms of services. It's very important for research, for policy development, and obviously all these things intersect. But it's it's something that I think we have to be really critical of more more broadly. Um, how do you know we need not just to produce more knowledge on race, but produce more knowledge on racism yes. and the you know how it's interconnected with race? Yes. Um, how can that type of work be supported? Again, how can we support and amplify um, researchers? Uh, and and other stakeholders within the response uh, who are doing this type of work or raising these type of issues to be heard, right? So essentially, when we're talking about the response specifically for Black women, looking at all the aspects that entails and asking them to do this fundamental work, right? To ensure that we can create a specific, a robust response that targets Black women, um, and then I think we can really better understand how treatment, support, and care, and so forth can be effective for them exactly. or more effective. Right. Thank you so much. Tola, it's almost time for me to let you go. I could listen to you talk okay. forever, but where can the audience find you and find updates on your project? Sure. Um, I'm actually in the process of developing a project website. So I do apologize for not having the website address available to you now, but I can definitely share that at a later time. I'm most act. You can find me on Twitter at TF Mbulaheni, my last name, um, as well. That, that's the platform that I think I'm most engaged in. Uh, so yes, feel free. And also, I'm, you know, if anyone has any questions about anything, I love having conversations. It's been a great way to connect, particularly during COVID. You can email me at tola.mbulaheni at mail.utoronto.ca. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. And if any of you want to find out more about CANFAR or CANFAR's 2025 campaign, go to canfar.com. Tola, I, I love us. I love to see Black women live it, uh, winning. I love Absolutely. to see Black women. So I want to say congratulations on everything and keep doing what you do. Thank you, Maluba. It was great talking to you today. Great talking to you too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, all for you watching. And again, like I said, check out canfar.com. And you can follow me at It's Maluba right on Instagram. I want to thank Canfar for, Canfar for this opportunity and Tola for joining us today. Take care, everyone.